Welcome to the Clackamas County Peace Officers Association Sheriff's Candidate Forum. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeff Burlew, and I am one of the CCPOA Vice Presidents and a 24-year veteran of the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office. Tonight, I will be your host and moderator for this event. Several weeks ago, you were asked to submit questions to the candidates. A panel of your coworkers took those suggestions and refined them down to the questions that will be asked tonight. The format for tonight's forum will present each candidate with a question and allow them a set amount of time to answer each question. Each candidate will answer each question so you can compare and contrast their answers. Each candidate will have the opportunity to be asked the first question and answer it first. All candidates were given four of the more complex questions to formulate a five-minute comprehensive answer. After hearing all of their answers, the candidates will take a 10-minute break. The next section of our forum will be the lightning round. Each candidate will be asked a question that they have no prior knowledge of, and they will have two minutes to provide an answer. At the conclusion of the lightning round, each candidate will have a five to eight minute period to make a closing statement. With no further delay, let's meet the candidates. Brian Jensen. Brian has over 29 years of combined military and law enforcement experience. Brian has been employed by the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office since August 1998 and is currently a lieutenant in the patrol division. Brian has experience as a municipal police officer, canine officer, SWAT team member, traffic enforcement officer, drug recognition expert, field training officer, patrol sergeant, contract city sergeant, field training sergeant, detective sergeant, computer forensic unit sergeant, crime scene investigation sergeant, public information officer, lieutenant, search and rescue commander, traffic unit commander, dive team commander, marine unit commander, international public safety leadership and ethics institute instructor, Oregon State Sheriff's Association command college graduate. These experiences have given Brian the opportunity to see what works and what doesn't work within an organization. Brian is prepared and uniquely qualified to lead the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office through a much needed change. Brian has been preparing for the last five years for this role and possesses the needed skill set to be successful as your next sheriff. Brian is prepared to commit the time and selfless sacrifice necessary for success. This is not something that Brian chose to do out of anger or frustration, but out of his desire to successfully change the course of our office and lead it through an evolution into the future. During Brian's time as PIO, he successfully collaborated with all divisions of our office, and there is no reason to believe he would do any differently as our leader. Brian's creativity, collaborative mindset, and courage will be a change for the positive for our office. Brian's focus will be on our office, our employees, and our community, Clackamas County. Angie Brandenburg. Angie's been a dedicated public servant since the age of 18, when shortly after high school, she joined the United States Oregon Army National Guard. She attended basic training at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and advanced individual training at Fort Gordon, Georgia, where she graduated with honors. Angie earned the rank of sergeant before her honorable discharge after nine years of service. Angie is an experienced leader and has faithfully served the residents of Clackamas County for over 29 years. She began her law enforcement career as a reserve deputy with the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office before she was hired as a full-time patrol deputy in 1992. Throughout her career with the Sheriff's Office, Angie actively sought out opportunities to serve in nearly every division of the Sheriff's Office, including appointments to special assignments. In addition to working as a patrol deputy for eight years, she served as a civil deputy for one year and a patrol sergeant and civil sergeant for six years. She has been a field training officer, a member of the Special Weapons and Tactics Team, and the Search and Rescue Team. Angie also served five years as the Sheriff's Office Public Information Officer. In 2012, Angie was promoted to the rank of Lieutenant and appointed Civil Division Commander overseeing operations of the County Courthouse, Civil Service of Process, and assigned to the Sheriff's Office Risk Management Duties. In 2015, Angie was appointed as an Investigations Division Lieutenant serving as the director of a Safe Place Family Justice Center. She held the rank of lieutenant for seven years before being promoted to undersheriff in 2019. 
For the past year, she has commanded 250 personnel from four divisions, patrol, investigations, training, and the Family Justice Center. As undersheriff, she serves as second in command to the sheriff, and in the sheriff's absence, assumes the duties and responsibilities of the office of sheriff. Personally, Angie has lived in rural Clackamas County for the past 34 years, growing up in Colton. She currently lives outside of Malala with her husband, John, of 16 years, and her two kids, Cole, 11, and Emma, 9. Lynn Schoenfeld. Lynn is a recently retired sergeant from the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office, where he spent 26 years. 20 years as a sergeant, he has supervised many special units from the SWAT team, the Special Investigations Unit, the Property Crimes Investigation Unit, the Craft Team, the Aero Squadron, the Computer Forensics Unit, and the Transit Police South Precinct. Early in his career, Lynn was assigned to the Gang Enforcement Unit when gang activity in the mid-90s began to make a sharp increase. Lynn commanded the SWAT team throughout 2007. Lynn is most proud of all the years he supervised patrol shifts. Lynn has led what many described as a storied career. He is unapologetic for his relentless and tenacious pursuit of the bad guy. He is known to lead by example, and he has enjoyed his career from day one to the day he retired. He looks back on his career and time at CCSO with pride. Lynn chose to remain in the sergeant rank for one purpose. He knew this was the best career choice to advocate for the deputies he supervised. It brings great joy to Lynn to see the deputies he has trained or supervised move on to become CCSO special unit members and leaders. His goal has never been to make higher rank or command. His goal has always been to make the work environment at CCSO fun, entertaining, collaborative, and a respectful, safe environment. We all know when we are happy in the workplace, the citizens of Clackamas County benefit. Lynn began his career 28 years ago, leaving his career as an electronics engineer to pursue his calling in law enforcement. Lynn received his Bachelor of Science in Electronic Engineering Technology from Oregon Institute of Technology, where he played football and rugby. After several years at CCSO, Lynn received his Master's in Business from Portland State University while working the graveyard shift at CCSO. Lynn is humbled by the support he has received in the campaign, and he looks forward to sharing his vision that will bring CCSO through these tough times. We'll begin with the four questions. Question number one goes to Brian Jensen. The current budget of the Sheriff's Office is in crisis. Special unit budgets are being reduced or eliminated. Training budgets have been cut. Jails beds could be closed. And the Transition Center is hemorrhaging money. In addition, there are no new funding sources on the horizon. If you were forced to implement a 5 to 10% budget cut, how would you implement the cut? What programs would you reduce or eliminate? And what are your priorities for service? So uh, I, I think to uh, talk about what needs to be uh, trimmed down or cut or replaced, I need to first uh, let you know what my priorities would be. And the priorities for the sheriff in, in uh, my view would be, uh, and this is in no special order, but would be retention and recruitment, uh, which includes wellness, training, uh, fiscal responsibility, intelligent, informed allocation of our resources. I think that we can... Uh, do better with what we got. Communication, accountability, repairing, creating, and maintaining relationships both with uh, other county leaders, with other organizations. But the number one priority for the sheriff, in, in my opinion, is going to be getting our agency stable funding. Now, for the agency, uh, first priority is going to be getting the right people in the right positions for success. And I'm not going to be able to do that alone. That's going to be a collaborative effort. That's going to be talking with uh, the boots on the ground. It's going to be talking with uh, other leaders in the agency. It's going to be uh, getting that information straight from the people. It's not going to be getting it second or third hand and then uh, making a determination on who belongs in what position. Uh, patrol and corrections and all the, and the units and the, the folks that support those people is, is an obvious priority. Uh, civil, PNP, and 
Uh, again, resource allocation. That's again, we got a lot of people doing a lot of jobs that, in my opinion, are unnecessary or that we we can trim down. Um, part of those would be uh, the PIO. Um, in my opinion, and I work as PIO full time for three years, as uh, a lot of you know. And uh, the East Coast, a lot of the PIOs are uh, civilian. And if we were to do something like that, the national average uh, is sixty-two thousand dollars a year. Um, we're typically a little bit higher than that, so even if we made that position an $80,000 job uh, salaried, uh, that'd probably be a thirty dollars to $40,000 budget savings, plus we would get a sergeant back on the road. Uh, same thing with fleet. Fleet, uh, I think if we made that a, an actual fleet manager, somebody with experience in that, um, we would, one, save money, and two, that would get a deputy back on the road. Uh, as far as potential cuts, so I looked over our budget, and... Uh, it's a it's a ton of numbers, and uh, I, I wanted to meet with uh, some of our budget folks and talk about it, but I haven't had that chance. But just looking at it right off the bat, we spend about it look for the best I could tell, we're upwards of half a million dollars just on our phones. Um, we're looking at two hundred fifty-two thousand dollars for telephone service, another one hundred fifty-three thousand dollars for cell phone service, and and again, I, I don't. I can't tell you the last time I used my desk phone, and I think that there's a lot of other people out there the same way. We're spending about $8,000 a year on pagers, which is a 1990s technology, $56,000 just on postage. And here's one that I, I was really frustrated when I was PIO. We spend over a quarter million dollars in an allocated cost to PGA. And what PGA is, is that's the county's uh, public and government affairs. It's basically, it's the county's PIO. And uh, we're giving them a quarter million dollars a year, plus we're spending I don't know how much on our PIO unit. And that, I mean, I think it's one or the other. If we need to use PGA, which there are times when we do, um, then we can do that on a contract basis and, and pay for that for jobs as they come, as opposed to just a $250,000 allocated cost. Uh, building maintenance is another allocated cost that we spend all, dang near $2 million on, about $1.7 million. And we have buildings that are routinely almost empty. I'm getting the notice. I got a minute left. Uh, so listen, if you have a budget, what we're going to do is we're going to train you how to use that budget. Nancy Artman is a genius, and we're actually going to there's going to be no more of the spend it if you got it. We're going to be responsible with it. Uh, our air unit, uh, we have an airplane that's been sitting in a hangar for who knows how long, and uh, that that would that would leave. Um, we would evaluate the transition center. Uh, that would be the first uh, service that I would cut. Um, the, the CSAP is a good program. I've talked with graduates from that. The transition center uh, is, is a little bit of fluff, and uh, I would cut that. Uh, I was looking at our inmates, um, and I would start billing them for the food. We spend 91 cents, 91 cents a meal on them, um, and they're going to start paying for it. So I think... Uh, I think I'm done. Thank you, Brian. Hi, good evening. First, I'm gonna, um, I want to tell you that I'm gonna tell you the truth. And it's not necessarily what you're gonna wanna hear. And I'm not gonna promise you things that I can't deliver. So that's my promise to you first off tonight. Um, I believe it's important to lay this foundation because as your, your sheriff, you need to know that you can trust me. Trust is developed by showing you in my actions and in my words that you can depend on what I say. I will never paint a rosier picture just to make it easier for you because we need to live in the reality. And if we don't recognize what's coming at us, we can't prepare for it and overcome it. So 77% of our budget is uh, in personnel. That pays for you and me. And each year that cost that goes uh, with the personnel goes up over $5 million a year. So that's PERS and incentives and the other things that, are, uh, that, uh, that you get, quite frankly, through the POA. Um, meanwhile, the general fund contribution from the county is not keeping up with that demand. So it's not gonna get better anytime soon because you all know the straits that the county's in and they're trying to save up money for other things. The result is in the need for us to trim our budget, budget in areas to avoid layoffs of people. That's why you're talking about these things that are being eliminated little by little. 
And our budget's not on a sustainable path. Uh, if we don't correct this with either additional funding from the county or we find an alternate funding source that's dedicated to us, um, the future is really uncertain. And uh, cuts are going to be coming by way of personnel if we don't figure this out. So I just want to go back in and answer the question you're asking is how would, we, how would I implement cuts? So to implement cuts, um, I can't do this by myself. I would have to do this with a team in order to figure out what needs to be cut or what's going to be cut. Part of that is having the POA at the table. Um, if we start making cuts, there'll be layoffs, there'll be a trickle down effect that we have to abide by the contract, your collective bargaining agreement. Um, but I want to tell you what my priorities would be um, for maintaining and supporting core essential functions. And these are in no particular order. Uh, the jail, enforcement, which is patrol and investigations, uh, civil and SAR. Um, on top of that, I think it's important for you to know that as sheriff, my ranking for cutting staff and who would go first, who would go last. Um, temporary employees, of course, would be first. Non-sworn, non-represented would be next. Command staff would be a third. Non-sworn POA would be fourth. And of course, last would be sworn POA, balancing between jail, patrol, and civil to maintain those, those services in balance. Um, and looking at <clears throat> some of the potential programs that could be reduced or cut, uh, Drive with the Cop, the Child Abuse and Family Violence Summit, that could go to an every other year and uh, I agree with Brian, the Aero Unit. Um, and as Sheriff, my, one of my goals is to examine these programs and special units asking three questions. Does it support our mission? Is it necessary? And is it working as intended? And if the answer is no, then we need to have the courage to end it. And as Under Sheriff, I've already done that. I've used this model. I ended the polygraph program, for example. Um, and uh, it's not easy. There's a lot of emotion tied to different things, but I will make the right decision no matter how hard that decision is, and I've already demonstrated that. So I did not mention community corrections and the transition center in here, center in, here in addition to CSAP, because their funding is totally separate from the sheriff's office. There, there is no money that comes from the sheriff's office that goes to community corrections. Um, or the transition center. It's all funded with state funding and county funded dollars for those programs. So if we were to cut them, uh, if we were to, to not have a relationship with community corrections, uh, we would not see uh, a cent that would go towards staffing deputies, uh, either the jail or civil or patrol. There's no fiscal impact. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Hello, I guess first of all what we need to discuss is we need to actually define this problem. How, how did we get here? We got out ahead of our skis. Our, uh, our costs have far ex uh, exceeded our revenues. And then you gotta ask yourself the questions, why? Plain and simple, it's mission creep. When you have a mission that is to become a world-class sheriff's organization, that leaves for a lot of, a lot of wiggle room. It, it allows you to stray from that vision. Some of the things that, uh, have, that, that where, where we have issues are forgetting what our community priorities are. What, what do the people who vote for us want us to do? Where do they want us to spend their tax dollars? There's definitely a lack of collaboration. That ties into how do we get along with our other in, uh, uh, inner office agencies, you know, the DA's office, Board of County Commissioners, to collaborate and find efficiencies to get the job done. And it's kind of the cusp of the whole thing is there's a, a severe impact on our core services. My focus would be on those core services. Of course, of course those are patrol, civil division, our corrections, and of course, investigations. We have to ask ourselves, what is pretty good to do for this county? Or what must we do for this county? We can't let the influences of, you know, pretty good high value things, high social value operations that 
should be done, but should they be, should they be taken on by the sheriff's office? We need to make those hard choices. We, we need to be done with the bleeding of our revenues to fund pet projects and special projects. We need to create a command staff that has a good comprehension on critical thinking, how to collaborate together. We need to create the ability to self-analyze. What did we do wrong? Because there has, we got out ahead of our skis for a reason. Many don't realize. In order to fund our, our world-class PIO unit that we cut, and, and some other uh, support services, we cut 19 full-time equivalents from the patrol deputy ranks, 19. You didn't see these because they were vacant positions at the time. However, we don't have them now. Many people don't know that when we decided to get into the Brooks Building, that we cut 10 full-time equivalents off the, uh, out of the jail deputy staff. We need to stop that kind of bleeding because that, 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 that pulls into other areas and we need to prioritize ourselves. Currently, uh, a support administration and, um, and uh, a support staff have a lot of positions, and uh, as my colleagues have said, have said, have said previously, a lot of non-sworn uh, positions. Are we doubling up our efforts? We need to find efficiencies to get our job done, whether it be in, in PIO or in, in, in some of those uh, other areas. It's important that we take every unit that we have and we go at it with a critical lens. Every analysis has to include a financial analysis. Yes, there is a human factor involved. However, we also need to apply that to the priorities that the citizens want us to do. They, they vote for us. We work for them. We need to spend their money wisely most effectively to get back to the mission that we as a team get together and, and, and we create. To get back to that vision, that, uh, that vision of, of, of doing right for the people. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. The second question will uh, start with Angie. The enhanced law enforcement district has been in place with the intention of providing police services to the citizens within the borders of the LED. The projected tax revenue for ELED fiscal year 2019-20 is $7,275,046. Of that, $6,171,517 is to fund personnel costs for 36 positions, one recruit deputy, 28 deputies, six sergeants, and one lieutenant. However, the districts within the ELED are routinely not staffed, and deputies from other districts are forced to shift to respond to calls within the ELED. Do you think this program is successful? How would you move forward with the ELED program under your administration? What would your plan for permanent and stable long-term funding for the Sheriff's Office? So currently the ELED funding is critical to funding patrol positions, patrol operations. Without it, we would be challenged to provide basic law enforcement services to those within the ELED boundaries. So the ELED began in 1995 uh, when our population was about 100,000 people less than it is now. Um, established cities in the ELED areas have been eating up this district. Measure 5 and Measure 50 also limited the amount um, that was collected with this original plan for the ELED. Happy Valley, um, other cities, but Happy Valley has since incorporated, uh, and within those city limits, they no longer contribute to the ELED. But one of the objectives of, of the ELED was to bring the ratio of one deputy per 1,000 uh, people and population in that district. Um, it funds the same uh, now as it did 15 years ago. So there's challenges with that district. It's large, it's segmented uh, across many law enforcement uh, jurisdictions, and, but the bulk of the district lies within the 99, 82, Milwaukee, Clackamas, Happy Valley, Johnson, uh, Johnson City area where it's densely populated. 
So without the additional study of hard data, I don't believe any one of us can say with absolute certainty that that does not, it's not successful, whether it's successful or not, and to what degree. I think anecdotally that we, you know, we, we know we always joke, hey, uh, um, the West Side car is getting pulled, we're not putting somebody over there. I, but I think that we really ha need to look at it and look at it with data. So uh, when I sat in front of the budget committee this last cycle, that was the question that was asked. And it's an uncomfortable position to be in. So we've looked at ways to try and solve that data collection and data analysis. And it really is uh, looking at a GIS mapping overlay uh, and also taking in tax assessor records of every person who pay or every property who pays into the, to the ELED. Um, and really, so we need, to, we need to answer that question, not only for ourselves and our staff, but uh, for the people who pay into the district. So hopefully we'll have that at some point here. But we really do need to develop a permanent funding source for the sheriff's office. And we need stable, long-term funding because the way we're doing business now is not good business. And uh, I believe that we need to be looking at a service district model. Um, I've had many conversations with Sheriff Nelson and Jutes County Sheriff's Office. They have two service districts. Their county is set up similar to ours. I won't get into the detail, but it's providing stable and dedicated funding. It's uh, it's managed by a uh, by a budget committee, so it's the oversight of the funding and the spending uh, has some strict oversight. But their program is healthy, it's sustainable, and it's doing better than they expected. Um, so I think upon form formation of a service district, um, the taxation of the ELED and the levy would go away. It would be basically rolled into this, um, and so uh, the cost of the taxpayer would be. Um, not not too large. Um, I don't want to go into the weeds here, but there are roadmaps out there. We don't have to recreate the wheel. We're not the first county to navigate this. Um, but moving forward, we'll need to do a feasibility study. Um, we'll, we need partnerships to do this. We can't do this alone. We need the Board of County Commissioners. Um, we need the ELED Board. We need the POA. And really, the final approval rests with the Clackamas County voters. And uh, But I think they're ready for it. Uh, conversations with the with the um, with the ELED board they actually brought it up the first time I met with them hey what about a taxing district what does that look like so I started asking questions and apparently we've done this before uh, the projections didn't turn out that well but I really think we need to dive into this and take a look at this um, and the bottom line is that we can't afford to wait our employees and our citizens deserve better than how we're serving them now thank you In 1994, I came on this department. Uh, that was prior to the uh, ELED uh, district going in place. It was voted in in uh, November of 94. So I was able to see how this department at the, and staffing levels were prior, and they were very similar to how they are now. Uh, when Sheriff Bradshaw uh, uh, developed the plan and got it through, we uh, immediately saw improvements. Our staffing levels, uh, like for instance, on, on 82nd on, on, on day shift, we immediately went to a 2-David 4-0, a 2-David 4-4, and a, a 2-David 4-2. So we typically had three, three 80 second cars at all times. As well, we had uh, two uh, 99 cars. We always had a west side car. That allowed us to always staff our uh, metro car, our boring car, uh, with, uh, with, our, with our general funded and, and, and levy positions. So when we answer these questions, this question, you, 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 you got to address a couple issues. Number one, why do the general funded positions go, you know, you know, why, why are they diminished to a point where we have to pull ELED district cars over into those areas? And, and, and here, here's why that is. ELED is uh, highly scrutinized. It's followed by a board every year that has to answer, that we have to answer to. They, it's, the, the numbers are right out there in the open. You know, that, that $6,171,000 uh, goes straight to officers. You cannot deny that, the, that, that those deputies are either in place or not. In other words, you can't use a shell game to hide those full-time equivalents. What's happening with the general fund and some of those positions, that is what is diminishing our counts in the jail and our counts on the road for full-time uh, e equivalents. We're, we're playing this game. Uh, and uh, where, where we uh, 
are adjusting for what we feel is uh, valued by the citizen. It, it, it seems incredible that after this many years running the ELED that half of our code deputies in the unincorporated area, half of the 62 that we fielded last month in the, in the last bump are fielded by the, uh, by the ELED. That's, that, that, seems, that seems ludicrous. So what we need to do, and, 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 and I agree with, uh, with, with Angie, we, we, we need to eventually roll into a, a service district model. But in the interim, we need to kind of model our, our general fund. It's easier to, find, to hide full-time equivalents doing other services, other support group, uh, 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 other support services out of the general fund and tax levy because they don't have as much, as much oversight. However, the ELED has to stay right there with our, with, with, with our assigned deputies. So likewise, what, what, what I would propose in the interim is that we assign our ELED districts how they should be as an ELED district. And then we, and then we work to uncover where, all are those, where are those full-time equivalents in, in the general fund hidden. We gotta get those back on the road, back to our core services back to investigations, back to patrol, back to civil, and back to corrections. Thank you, Lynn. So is the ELED a success? Yeah, it's a success. It's $7 million, it's 36 positions. That, that is a success. I think we can manage it better. Uh, I think, so, we, it's getting smaller. The ELED is getting smaller because the cities are annexing it. There's no, there's no doubt about that. The reason that it's increasing is because, of course, the property taxes are increasing. So what we need to do is we get we have data now that we didn't have 15, 20 years ago. And we're able to analyze that data. And that's what we need to do when it comes to staffing districts. I'm not saying that we're staffing them incorrectly now, but I think that we have data that is available to us now that we didn't have 15, 20 years ago and the data doesn't lie and that is how we need to staff our districts and that can be explained to the ELED board uh, they're, they're, get, they're getting their money's worth right they're getting not only are they getting at least these 36 deputies they are staffed 24 hours a day uh, the county is staffed 24 hours a day if you call us at two or three o'clock in the morning a deputy is going to come now you may not have a deputy that is sitting in your driveway 24 hours a day but we provide 24-hour coverage to the citizens of Clackamas County there's a small pocket of ELED on the west side, um, which is just a microscopic section compared to the rest of the west side district. Um, it does not make sense to have a deputy over there on ELED money just to patrol that one little area when inevitably what happens because of call demand, they get called back over to the 99 side or the 82 side. That's where the calls are, that's where the population is, and I think, I, I know the data would, would pr prove that. And what we need to do is staff our districts, look at the districts, see if they are even correct, and then staff those appropriately based on call load um, is what we need to do. As far as a taxing district, I, yeah, I mean, Angie and Lynn are right. That's, that's exactly what we need. Deschutes County is a good model. Um, that would replace the ELED. It would replace the uh, levy that we go for every few years. Uh, the hard part, the hard part about a taxing district for us, listen, the community supports us. They all, they have, have supported us since I got here in 98 and you know any thing that we do or we're, we're trying to figure out if they support us or not comes back high we have we got great community support the tough part is going to be getting the county to give up control of the finances that's going to be the tough part and that is where the sheriff comes in the sheriff is going to have to have those those battles with with the folks that don't want to give up control of the money but we need to do that for our citizens and quite frankly more importantly we need to do it for uh everybody that works at the sheriff's office that's that's what's paying our paychecks and we need to get stable permanent funding uh taxing taxing excuse me taxing district uh will go for about 30 they'll give us about 30 years uh before basically it's get, it's going to cross over and it's going to be no longer uh, financially viable um, that's 30 years. That's going to be everybody in here is going to be retired in 30 years, probably everybody watching too. And that'll give us 30 years to work on another plan for when that time comes. So no doubt the, the funding way to go, the best that I have found out, I've asked several people. I, I've also spoke with uh, Sheriff Nelson. Um, 
because they have a good model. And I've, I've talked with several of the uh, folks around our office who I trust their opinions, and we all are in agreement that taxing district is the way to go. The fight is gonna be with the county, and I am willing to take on that fight. That's all I got. Thank you, Brian. Question number three. What, in your view, is the current state of morale at the sheriff's office? Why do you think it is the way it is? What, if anything, would you do to address it? We'll start with Lynn. Yes, first of all, I want to explain that uh, I've traveled quite a bit in this last couple of months since I've been out on the campaign trail, and the citizens love our deputies. They love everything we do in every, in, in every aspect. But I worry about that in, in the future with uh, some of the current stuff going on, uh, you know, in West Lynn, whatnot, and, uh, and some of the concerns over how we uh, deploy our troops in the field. As deputies, we like to keep uh, our, our laundry in-house. You guys know that. We don't want to upset the, the citizen. However, we do talk and we know how our, our morale is. And our morale is low. And it's, it's low for a few reasons. First of all, and I've spoken to you guys before on this topic, uh, there's a lack of a shared vision. Was there a vision at one time? Yes. Uh, was it ever shared? I guess in the form of plaques and uh, $10 picture frames, uh, it, it was shared around the, the various buildings. But that doesn't make a shared vision. A shared vision starts with a collaboration of the people that you're going to lead. We need to come up with our shared vision together as a group. When we are striving towards the same goal, the, uh, the happiness naturally follows. Another aspect of this is uh, overtasking and call load. I've been out there uh, having to make shifts out of hardly any deputies. I've been out there having to cancel calls, uh, trying to make uh, everyone's life a little easier. Um, that really changes the culture of your, uh, of your agency and it uh, really diminishes your, your motivation. I'm, and I understand why. Uh, what I worry about is when we, when we diminish our motivation and we, we get out of the habit of doing, doing good for the people. We get out of the habit of doing that little extra that it takes to get that that you know that guy's bicycle back or whatnot. Um, we end up doing just enough to survive. We end up parking, waiting for that next priority call, and you know we we it hinders our our, our ability to go out there and self-generate activity and do the things that make this job fun. Like why, why most of us got into the job. Plus, not being part of the solution. I mean, I've been a sergeant now for a little over 20 years and chose to stay in, 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 in the patrol ranks, as mentioned earlier, for the right reasons. And I really feel like I haven't had any direction above my lieutenant. Uh, it's almost like there was a mission and a vision there, and then we lost track of it and a whole nother avenue was followed. And all we were here as sergeants and deputies, we're, we're just trying to get the job done. We're just trying to do right by the citizens, catch the bad guys and have fun while we're doing it. So our priority is gonna have to be to get back on our mission. We strayed from it. Set a vision that we can work with. It's not so ambiguous. Working with the community for the community. Get back to what's fun about our, our job. Get back to the doing good for us, doing good for the community. And when you decide what you're going to do good for the community, you do it with tenacious abandon. And you have a lot of fun doing it. And you make the, get that fun back. And it starts with vision. And it starts with our staffing levels. Thank you. So I think overall morale is okay. Uh, we all want change and we don't want a little change. We all want big change. 
Um, and I think the morale is affected right now a little bit uh, because of the unknown of our future. And I think that that's a, that's a reasonable uh, deal. And I think that that is wh why maybe morale might be just a tad bit on the low side. But if you take the unknown out of the equation, our, mo our morale I don't think is great, but I don't think it's in the toilet either. I, uh, not saying that there aren't pockets. There are pockets of really, really bad morale, and there are pockets of really, really high morale. I'm talking about just the general outlook on morale. I think at our office, from, from my view, from what I have seen, I think it's okay. Now, I think corrections is historically lower than uh, patrol, and I, I think that has to do with, with several things. I think, one, their work environment is arguably tougher. Um, it's definitely, I mean, you're in four walls, you're in there with a bunch of bad people. I think that that has an effect on morale. Um, so I understand why their morale may be a little bit uh, historically lower than, than patrols. Um, the third floor morale, I think, is pretty good. They don't trust the fourth floor. They haven't trusted the fourth floor for quite a while now, and that's evident. And that has an effect on morale. But when I go into a graveyard roll call, everyone there is, is rocking and rolling, and, and, and things are great. Um, morale in our profession overall is probably lukewarm. Uh, that's just the, the, the negative uh, media input that we get. Um, that has uh, outside influences have a negative effect on us. Uh, our office has a history of not being fair, and fairness affects morale. Fairness really matters when it comes to promotion, special unit selection, and discipline. And uh, thank goodness the union keeps uh, command on their toes when it comes to discipline, but we haven't been fair. And again, fairness affects morale. I will empower and provide autonomy to leaders who will in turn do the same to deputies and those who follow them. Um, there will be a change of the executive team if I am sheriff, and there will be a change of command staff. New leaders will have the skill set to do the job that we expect and demand of them. Um, they will have the right mindset, and they will have the right heart set to take our agency into the future. I will encourage autonomy, creativity, and fairness in my command staff, and I will ensure that that is encouraged down the chain. Another way of improving morale is going to be giving people, giving them hope, giving them inspiration and motivation. Um, I will, again, I will encourage creativity, hope for advancement, and hope for, or for opportunities will be evident. I will work with command staff, and I will ensure that there are opportunities for all employees, not just the patrol guys, not just the correction, but our non-sworn. Um, there will be opportunities. Training our employees, every single one of them, will be a priority under my administration. We will make better employees by paying attention and by caring. It will be my job to create a culture in our office that we have not seen in, in my 22 years here. And that culture is going to be one that will allow for creativity and that will allow uh, for, for the very bottom person to the very top person to bring an idea forward. That idea will be considered. You might not take that idea, right? But you will be heard. The culture, the culture will improve morale. Every employee will know the vision, but more importantly, every employee will know how they fit into that vision. And that's what's important, is they will know how they fit into that vision. They will be a part of it. Uh, those are kind of my initial thoughts on, on increasing morale. I agree that uh, morale can get better. That's all I got, Jeff. Thank you. So I agree with uh, Brian that there are varying degrees of, um, depends on who you ask for morale problems. And so someone sitting there right now watching this uh, who may be in records has a different view of um, what their morale is versus the jail. Um, you're gonna get some different answers. And each group has its own unique needs and issues and relationships with their peers and with their supervisors. But I mean, with that being said, there are large areas of the office that we have morale issues within the sheriff's office. And I believe those issues are tied to some pretty, pretty big and hefty things. Like I told you, I'm gonna tell you the truth. So the need for more staffing, we already know that, uh, and the current demands, especially in patrol. The jail, we need a new jail to meet the safety needs of our deputies. Um, there is a lack of equal accountability between line staff and command staff. And 
there's lack of confidence and leadership in the command ranks because people feel that the decisions have to go all the way to the top before they can come back all the way to the bottom if they come back to the come back to you all who are making suggestions so there's frustration also from the outward focus and attention that are spent on less important things rather than rather than putting the time and the energy into our own employees, our own issues, our own problems that need to be addressed for the health of our agency and that welfare of our employees. And there's also, I mean, I can go on, I only have five minutes, but lack of good communication between all levels, uh, which results uh, when there's a lack of communication and frustration, misunderstanding, lack of cohesiveness, and it breeds distrust between employees and then groups of employees. But one common thing I have heard um, is that across the board is the optimism for the future. So with the le upcoming leadership change with the sheriff, that there's a chance and a change for a really hard reset. And I have a plan for that hard reset. Um, as sheriff, you will be my number one priority. So as under sheriff, I've already done that for you. In the past year, taking care of your safety issues, your workplace issues, fighting for funding so that you, um, quite, quite frankly, we don't uh, lose any positions uh, because of the county funding. And as your sheriff, I will spend the time working alongside you across all divisions, actively listening to your concerns, understanding your needs before they become issues and problems, and developing a relationship with you. That's what I believe a good sheriff does. And then I will select an executive team of character, of people who have a demonstrated history of taking care of people people I think the focus should be on creating a culture of care uh, for your health your well-being so that you can take care of our community I will also work collaboratively with the POA leadership to avoid and minimize issues that impact you individually but also you as a group and we can do that if we work together and we've already done that since I've been here for the last year. I will also set clear expectations of my command staff and hold them to a higher standard for their actions. And if they don't abide by those expectations, they won't be part of the command staff because you can't pick and choose some of your command staff. It has to actually be performance-based. You can't just come out and wipe everybody um, off the map. So, um, But I will also empower my command staff to make decisions because that's what a highly functioning department does. It's, it's not about micromanaging. Uh, it's about empowering your people who, quite frankly, can make decisions. And then I will focus on communications within our office as well. But finally, I think most importantly um, is that we also, we need, to, we need to solve this funding issue for the Sheriff's Office. And I will put in the hard work, I'll build the relationships uh, necessary to develop that long-term funding strategy. Thank you. Thanks. The jail, unlike patrol, is a statutory obligation of the Sheriff's Office. With that in mind, what is your five-year plan for the Corrections Division, the deputies that work there, and the facility? Uh, the, the folks that work in there, the, dep the deputies that work in there will have more opportunities if I am Sheriff. Uh, I would have them take over civil, with the exception of process. Uh, I want to get what I would like to have them do is do a, a patrol transport van uh, seven days a week out there uh, that would keep our patrol deputies in district and it would get our it would get some of our patrol or excuse me correction deputies out of the jail uh, special unit opportunities we have those for them I would encourage them to apply more to our special units and they won't be selected on assignment based on assignment but they can be selected based on their ability and their potential best person for the job no matter their assignment if there's an opening on dive team uh, we're gonna take the best person regardless if they work in corrections or the patrol we're gonna take the, the best one that we can find in-house leadership will be training or excuse me in-house leadership training will be offered uh, to those who are interested I don't think I don't think the our correction guys get enough opportunity down there and I don't think that they get trained um, in leadership and, and, and things like that and that's uh, that's us failing them and that will change uh, we need a new jail there's no no doubt about it 
my first funding priority is going to be getting stable funding for the sheriff's office. That's going to take, that will take a term. Uh, once we get that, and I'm confident that we will, then we're going to work on the jail. By that time, we will have established trust in the community. The community is going to know that we are fiscally responsible and we're transparent. And they are going to uh, agree with our spending habits. So our relationships will be strong and the timing will just be better. Uh, I'm going to work on selling that new jail the day I swear in. It's going to be something that is, it's, it's not a quick fix. It's, it's going to be a lot of money, but it's absolutely the right thing to do. The work environment is hard, and that building makes a difference. It makes it harder to come to work working in that building as opposed to a new one. There's just no way around it. The intelligence that the jail provides is invaluable. Uh, they provide our intelligence. Uh, our Can You ID Me page gets identified. Probably 70% of those come out of the jail. Probably 80% when they, you combine P and P in the jail um, are, are doing that. So they are, even though maybe I don't know how they feel on it, but they are absolutely providing a vital service, and, and we are all in this, in this together. Correction needs a shakeup in their command. Uh, there's just no other way I can say it. They need a shakeup in the command, and if I'm the sheriff, they're going to get it. Uh, we will comply with ICE subpoenas if I am sheriff. Uh, we expect people to, uh, who don't want to cooperate with us. Uh, we give them a subpoena or a warrant, and all of a sudden they comply, and we should be no different. Uh, I'm going to look at, we're spending a lot of money on at the jail. I think we can save money. We're about 91 cents a meal three times a day uh, for our inmates. I was looking at, uh, I just got back from uh, Phoenix, I was looking at Maricopa County, their meal is down to about 71 cents. So that adds up. Uh, we spend about $12,000 a month on meds. I think we can maybe do better on that, I don't know, but it's, it's looking at these type of things as an outsider and asking questions. And again, I think we can all work together and I think things can definitely improve over there uh, for the correction guys. So five year plan. We're going to hopefully at the five year mark, we're going to start working on getting uh, funding for their for their new corrections and the morale is going to be picked up over there because the correction folks are going to have a lot more opportunity under under my administration. Thank you. you go. Yeah. So there's no doubt we all agree we, we need a new jail. So we know the jail's old, it poses safety uh, issues for our staff, it's not ADA compliant, and it quite frankly is a money pit. Uh, my job as sheriff is to not let those in leadership of the county who will have to support us uh, know that we need a new jail at every single opportunity. And right now we're competing for a new courthouse. And that doesn't mean that, uh, that there isn't work that can be done to lay the foundation and to continue um, laying that foundation and planning for a new jail. Um, but it's going to be an interesting time right now. Um, but I believe there's opportunity uh, as we move forward with looking at that stable funding uh, for perhaps a jail facility to be within that plan. Um, it all depends on, on, on relationships and figuring out uh, where we can be creative with some of the funding. But I do think that that could be part of that strategy. So uh, in regards to deputies, jail staffing remains a priority. Um, I know the floater position at the jail is um, something that's extremely valuable uh, to you working at the jail, and I'll work to protect that and to get you staffing so that you'll have that. Um, but the jail will also benefit from a stable funding source. And uh, that, like I said, that can, we keep coming back to that. That's definitely something we need to do. And then I've also heard concerns that the jail deputies um, believe that uh, they, they may uh, not have their commission cards uh, renewed with the new sheriff, but I, I will uh, support that policy of, of, of retaining commission cards. I just want to put that out there. So um, I will also continue to provide opportunities for deputies to work outside the jail. Um, in civil, when I was a civil commander, I was there when we added the, uh, the jail deputies uh, to the staff down there and I supported this move. Um, and I think it's turned out extremely successful. 
just alone in the communication and the safety aspect of sharing information between the jail and the patrol deputies that were working at Civil. It was absolutely huge. Uh, and then just in the techniques of booking and keeping people safe when we transport folks. Um, most, and then recently, since I've been under sheriff, we moved two more deputies to, um, to Civil and we moved two 103 uh, patrol deputies out to the road to get more funding and get more staffing out to the road. I, I, I absolutely support that. But I also know there's concerns from patrol that uh, all those civil positions will eventually become uh, uh, corrections, and I, I don't agree with that. I think patrol needs to, to be assured that there are places um, that they can get out of a patrol car and work uh, down at civil and have opportunities to work at civil. Um, they, they deserve that. So we're stronger when we're working together, and definitely, definitely the courthouse of civil is stronger since we've combined those teams down there, and I'm not gonna break that up. Um, and then I also uh, will support the continued work of EHG and also the work crews. Um, I will continue supporting transports and extraditions, and, and I was a civil commander down at the courthouse during the time that I made the decision to move extraditions from civil to the jail. Trust me, I took a lot of heat for it, but it was the right thing to do. Again, it's looking at programs, what makes sense? Is it res fiscally responsible? Um, and it wasn't, and I made that decision to move extraditions to the jail to provide extra um, opportunities for, for uh, jail deputies. Um, and then also, I, I wanna make sure that you know that I will continue to promote uh, opportunities for all jail staff to be part of our, our special teams and units and programs where, uh, where appropriate. Uh, when, I got, when I was here in 1992, um, there wasn't a lot of opportunities for our, our jail staff and uh, other staff working at the jail. And combining our teams and uh, our resources together absolutely makes us a stronger sheriff's office. So that's my commitment. Thank you. As you know, I've uh, come up and spoke with quite a few of you at your shift change, and that was for a reason. Um, when I decided to run for sheriff, uh, your hearts were number one on my priority list. I wanted to find out just what made you guys tick, what affects your morale, what you like about what we're doing, what you dislike about what our, uh, our county's doing. Um, as priorities for me, what I, what I glean from that is everyone's tired of being down staffing positions, having to run around. If someone has to go off and do a hospital watch or whatnot, it leaves you guys very, at, very much at unsafe levels. We need to find our, our, our efficiencies inside the jail and find uh, unique ways to alleviate uh, the stress. Uh, not just the stress on, on you guys, but the stress on um, the, uh, the sheriff's office uh, patrol ranks and, and the city patrol ranks. Yeah, as you know, uh, uh, having to come to the jail and be and be turned away can be a, 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 a can really tie up a road officer for a long time. We, we need to find ways to to uh, get the patrol officer back on the road. It also will get you know be a way to get you guys out of that ten-hour shift of sitting there in the in in those uh, in those walls having to smell the same recirculated air. I understand those, those dilemmas. You guys have made that quite clear. Um, as officers and, and deputies, we have to deal with the, with the bad guy for about a, a 10 minute transport to up, up to your facility. You guys have to deal with them for your whole shift. Uh, so opportunities to get outside the jail uh, are, are, are cherished. I understand that getting opportunities to work down in civil uh, the EHD program, which I'd like to see expanded, in fact. Um, I'd like to see uh, a uh, transport car that not only transports on hospital and whatnot, but also transports from the field. I would like to see that expanded into the local uh, police agencies to, uh, to, to help alleviate some of their issues. Um, we need to evaluate the existing programs that we have in the jail and uh, ask if that program fits our mission. Is it, is it, uh, is it uh, cost effective? Yes, there does have to be a, a, a facilities upgrade, but uh, not at the expense of, in, of employee count. Uh, uh, 
the uh, full-time equivalent funded positions and our, uh, your safety and the community safety. We, we have to keep that in mind. It's a long-term project, especially with uh, everyone arguing over, over this courthouse uh, situation. Deputies in the jail will ha have been and will always be uh, a commission deputies. I see no changes there. Uh, very highly respected uh, position. My hat is off to the things that you guys do every day. I can go into my patrol car, I can scream at my horn button, but you guys have to deal with it. And I'm, uh, uh, I'm uh, quite astonished at the, at the control that you guys have. With that in mind, we, we do need to continue to find opportunities on the special units. I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware of, I was the first one to suggest on the SWAT team that we should have jail deputies as our, uh, as our H and T uh, operators, as well as our, um, as our navigators and vehicle operators. And, uh, that came to my mind because you guys talk to these guys for 10 hour shifts and you know how to speak to them. You guys got to have that gift of gab. And so what I found, even on the first couple of deployments with the SWAT team, is that that was an irreplaceable asset. So with that, with that in mind, there, there are, there are, there are, uh, there are uh, values and characteristics that jail deputies possess that uh, uh, road deputies do not uh, possess. And we need to learn how to, uh, to uh, utilize these to make, our, our, to make our, our, our programs work and to be a more e efficient uh, law enforcement agency. Thank you. So we've come to the end of the first section of our forum. Uh, we will take a short break and we'll come back about 8.20. So refill your drinks, get some more popcorn, and we'll see you back then.
Okay, welcome back to the 2020 CCPOA Sheriff's Candidate Forum. We've entered the second phase of the forum, and this is the lightning round. We'll ask each candidate a question that they have not previously heard or seen. They'll have two minutes to answer each question. We'll start with Brian and rotate the order in which the questions are answered. So starting with Brian, question number one. What do you do in your first 100 days as sheriff? What do I do in the first 100 days as sheriff? Yes. Uh, well, I think one of the first things I, I would do is I was going, I would uh, put my command, put my executive team together and then uh, using the input from the executive team, uh, we would make the command team uh, what it should be and, and where we would want it. Uh, after that, I would make my rounds uh, to each division um, in, within the sheriff's office, and I would sit down and have a real conversation uh, with, with everybody that wanted to come and have a conversation with me. And we would talk about uh, what their plan is, uh, how I could help, them and their division get there and what the problems are and basically I would let them know that there's a new way that we're doing things and that's going to be a, in a collaborative manner. Um, my plan would be to work uh, one day a month out of the jail, same thing down in PNP and of course uh, the rest of the time would be uh, going around the different divisions. Um, at that point I would also start making uh, uh, attempts to build relationships with the Board of County Commissioners and other county leaders. I would also uh, make time to uh, make the rounds to the different police agencies within our county and speak with them. And I would also speak with community leaders and uh, figure out what their needs are, what their wants are, what their demands are, and see how that would fit into uh, our, our mission. And looks like I'm about I got a little more time than I'm being told. Uh, so th that's at about day 98. I mean, those first 100 days are going are gonna to go by uh, super fast. But I think the priority, of course, is going to be getting uh, the correct executive team together and then the correct command team together uh, to get our, our agency pointed in the right direction. Uh, the first 100-day plan, uh, First of all, I would build, spend time building an executive team, uh, like I spoke before, an executive team of people of character. It's very important to spend time. Um, obviously, I, I have an idea of, of who that might be now. I'm not willing to share it now. Um, but definitely spending time building that leadership team, which is going to set the tone and the culture for the agency for at least the next four years. And uh, the second I would do would be to align my priorities uh, with the new DA coming in and ensuring that I built, uh, continue to build, we have a good relationship, uh, but that relationship, working in partnership and, um, and repairing some of the damage that has been done over the years. It's, it's uh, hugely important uh, for that, for our agency, but also for our community. Uh, we have so much work that we need to do together. I would also bring together a group <clears throat> to go over our budget. Um, I have that as one of my priorities, is to open up our books. Um, and let's just dispel some of these rumors and um, these notions that a uh, ton of money is getting squandered, where it's getting squandered at, uh, is to open it up and, and to put a group together. Where do we want to spend that money? What priorities do we want to set? POA will have a, a seat at that table. Um, community members, others, uh, I say open up the books, let's take a look. Um, you know, we need to be fiscally transparent and open, um, you know, and, and in that, can we move more bodies to patrol uh, or the jail? The next I would do is I would spend time, uh, as Brian would, as, has said, that I want to spend time with my people, um, and with each unit, which every division, and to really develop relationships within our agency um, and perhaps get to know your name. Um, also, I would like to also further develop, I have relationships with a lot of our community folks, with our other uh, leaders of our law enforcement agencies, but I would um, move to do that, build Thank deeper you. relationships. Well, I, I would say first and foremost, I would work uh, very diligently to collaborate, get a 
good group of, uh, of stakeholders together within the department to include CCPOA, the jail, uh, patrol deputies, uh, existing command staff, and uh, come up with uh, what we see as the mission and, and the vision. Uh, that would be built on a collaborative effort. From that mission and vision, we would build our uh, executive command staff around that. Uh, at, quite frankly, with the collaboration of, uh, of, of, of CCOPOA, jail, uh, jail deputies, uh, uh, patrol deputies, supervisors, we would come up with a, a command staff team that will fit our vision. Um, and I think, quite frankly, you'll, uh, you'd be surprised. You'll probably come up with the same people that I do. Uh, from there, we start to, uh, prior to even getting into first day, I will have a exhaustive list of uh, areas to analyze, uh, areas to find out where we can find efficiencies. Uh, working on getting our full-time e e equivalents back to where they should be, and that is uh, back to uh, uh, our, our core services to uh, help uh, and fulfill the, uh, the, the wishes of the uh, people. Um, I've, I've met with a lot of, of former budget, uh, what, uh, 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 budget members, uh, team members, and whatnot, and we've we've already come up with some ideas of where we can look into. I would uh, I, I would work on uh, an, an exhaustive plan on how to uh, execute these kinds of uh, th these ideas so that we can uh, find efficiencies and uh, get back on track. Thank you. Question number two, starting with Angie, excluding funding. What do you see as the top three problems at the sheriff's office, and what would you do to fix them? So I would say the first, uh, excluding funding, top issues at the sheriff's office are the morale issues that we've talked about already tonight. Um, we have to provide a foundation um, uh, that's built with trust and leadership, um, with um, putting people of character, of integrity, honesty, humility, taking care of people at the top. So really everything um, really hinges on, on good leadership. And uh, so morale issues need to be fixed first, and that is with, uh, with changes in leadership, holding that leadership accountable, and making sure that, uh, that we're doing right by our people. Uh, the second one, um, I would say, uh, for me, is developing a wellness program for the sheriff's office, and um, it ties back into funding right now, but really is developing a robust wellness uh, uh, unit to take care of our people. Uh, more cops uh, kill themselves by their own hand than bad guys are taking our lives, and that's unacceptable. Um, and so making sure that we, that we take care of ourselves has to be up there. Um, and of course, I'm going to talk about livability and homeless because um, that's affecting everybody right now. It's affecting cops. We're expected to be mental health care professionals. Um, there's no place to take folks. We don't have, you know, homelessness is tied to mental health and drug addiction. And the county is uh, woefully lacking in resources um, that we need. Um, when I uh, started here, I was able to take folks to Damish. Uh, we rarely had to go back and, 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 and meet that same person again. And I'd like to hope that that person was getting better. But uh, our mental health and drug addiction resources will absolutely, if we had those, would help us with our homeless issue. Um, and then also, you know, working with our other partners um, with the homeless Thank issues. Thank you. Thanks. First and foremost, we need to get our, our, our motivation and morale back up. Uh, and as I would mentioned previously, this is through a, 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 a very well collaborated shared vision. Uh, that's free. That, that doesn't cost money. That just takes uh, a, a collaborator in chief. It takes, uh, it takes uh, the shedding of ego so that, this, so that you can be part of, of, of the solution. Uh, restoring relationships. Uh, we've done a significant uh, 
damaged with our relationships with the municipal agencies, with the Board of County Commissioners, with the DA's office. Um, those are things that come for free. We need to restore that, uh, that, that trust and that uh, synergistic energy that comes from uh, working together. Uh, livability issues. That's been on the forefront of my mind for uh, several years now, being the, uh, the, uh, the uh, department a liaison. The, uh, the, the invisible elephant in the room is the impact that the livability issue has on, on, on our crime rates. It's not by chance that we have the most shoplifted Home Depot, the most shoplifted Fred Meyer uh, in the nation. Um, however, it's, it, it's, we, we, we can't chase it with, uh, uh, with arrests. We can't arrest our way out of the situation. It is definitely a, uh, a social issue that, needs, that has a, a complete social aspect to it that we need to get a collaboration and build work groups around getting uh, the uh, drug and alcohol treatment that we need, the uh, mental health uh, issue solved. We can't even, get, can't even get to the mental health issue until we detox. Thank you. So those are issues that we can address. Uh, thanks. So uh, I, as I see it, there's, there's two different avenues here. There's uh, internal problems and external problems. I'm going to focus on the internal problems as far as I, how I see them. And the biggest one is, is an absolute lack of leadership. And uh, that will change, and that will change quick, fast, and in a hurry. Uh, that lack of leadership is, is troubling in the sense that it, it, it's that that in itself affects morale and uh, it, it, it uh, is, a, is a problem and uh, that needs to be fixed another one is that it seems that our focus is oops I'm sorry I didn't mean to lean into that our focus is heavily external and not internal and I would turn that around and I would start I would focus back on the employees I would focus on our processes and our policies and, and how basically how we're, we're running business right now um, needs to change and we can do much better. And that is a problem facing our agency. And the third and final one that I see for an internal is our allocation of resources. I think we can, we can do much better on, we, we, can, we can do better with what we have than what we're doing. I think we're, we're spread way too thin and we need to kind of uh, circle the wagons and bring it back in and uh, figure out what our core service is and focus on that and get resources uh, where they need to be to better uh, tackle that problem. Those are the three I see. That's all I got. Well, I got you. a lot more, but that's the three I'm going to choose. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Question number three for Lynn. In your view, what is the role of organized labor in a police organization? How would you work with the labor organization as sheriff? Organized labor is the lifeblood of what gets uh, our, our, our duties, our tasks done. Um, where the rubber meets the road with our citizens is at, at the deputy level. And, and, and it's, it, it's, it's important to have a, a motivated, uh, happy uh, uh, labor union and that, that, that doesn't feel like they have to fight for everything. Now, you, you still need to be fiscally responsible as, a, as someone in management. I understand that. However, when we limit the variations in what we do in our processes, whether it be signing up for overtime, whether it be how we... Uh, how we uh, do uh, our, our six-month bump, how we follow through on, on, on disciplinary actions. We limit that variation and we hold a, a, a standard. The, the, the deputy doesn't feel like they're pulled in multiple directions. Uh, it's, it's a reaction. When you, when you limit that variation, you have a, a, a happy labor force. With a happy, happy labor force, that byproduct is happy citizens, a, a, a happy customer. And so it's in everyone's best interest to collaborate. 
That's what uh, that's at the heart blood of, uh, of of organized labor is to collaborate and 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 to come to an understanding and, and bring all all stakeholders into that uh, decision making process, and to not have to. The best way is to solve issues early. Don't let a, don't make them have to go to arbitration. Solve them early. Thank you. Could you ask the question one more time, please? Yes. In your view, what is the role of organized labor in a police organization? How would you work with the labor organization as sheriff? Got it. So, uh, listen, I've been a union guy my entire life. My dad was a lifetime uh, timber union guy. Um, I was a union guy when I worked for the city of North Bend. I've been union up until just a, well, actually about a year ago, I, I was in our union, which is 20, about 21 years in our union. Uh, I have a great relationship with the union. I respect the union and they are absolutely vital uh, to our agency and how I see them fitting into the role of our organization is they are, they are top tier. Um, I, I think that the, the union has a great amount of common sense, so do I. And I, I think that, I, I know that, again, I have a great relationship with the union. I know that as, as if I were sheriff, that relationship is only gonna become stronger. Uh, I often go to, even now, as, as my role in command, I go to uh, the union and ask them questions and I solicit ideas from them and I make sure that I'm doing things the right way uh, the right way. So I, I, I think having a, a preemptive conversation with the union before we, we act on things is vital to the success of the organization. And uh, yeah, I mean, they, they are, they work, again, they're top, top tier. Uh, I, as sheriff, I would have a monthly luncheon or dinner or breakfast or something uh, with uh, the union. And uh, you know, probably on the union's dime, but uh, <laughs> Uh, no, I, I am a strong, strong union supporter. I think we're all, we all have the same goal in mind and uh, we're going to work together and, and we're going to get there. That's all I got. Thank you. Yeah. So I think the role of a, a organized labor, labor in a police environment is really to create a fair environment, uh, for its members. Um, Many of you may not know this, but I was the union secretary for two years um, back in the day. And so um, organized labor at CCPOA is absolutely vital. And it's vital because uh, you, need, you need one collective voice to get things done, um, especially when you have the membership that CCPOA does. And, um, and somebody needs to, um, to be the leader. And um, not only does, does the POA um, uh, become the voice for the members, but it also uh, creates due process and protections for its members, especially in a police organization when you have deadly use of force. And so, um, so it's vital, and it's not, it doesn't have to be contentious with management. Um, there is that, um, there is, there's always um, a chance for that, um, but if you don't let egos get in the way and you have honest conversations, um, a lot can be done. And I, and I think I've worked pretty good with POA uh, this last year as under sheriff. Um, and um, really for us is to develop trust and to work together. It's really working together for the common good of the members. And the members are employees at the sheriff's office. And so um, with that in mind, um, you know, I think that it's absolutely necessary to have a um, to have a, a labor organization in a police environment. Thank you. The fourth question uh, will be answered by Brian to start with. The current job market has created a very difficult recruiting climate for law enforcement agencies. What would you do to bolster recruiting efforts to ensure we are choosing from the right applicants? Uh, that's a good question, and that question is being asked all over the country right now. It, it, I, I think that that is a problem that is facing our profession as much as it is our organization. And I think that uh, creating a culture that is inviting, uh, and, and, and by doing so, creating that culture, uh, word gets out. The best recruiters we have are, are the, 
there are the deputies on the road the deputies in the jail the boots on the ground are the best recruiters we have and if they are treated well and they are treated with respect in their opinions are listened to and then they will they will go out there and they will bring in the best of the best to work with them we all want the best folks working for us we don't want people slipping through that are going to disgrace our organization or our profession and again the the best way to do that is to treat our employees well to treat them great and word will get out they will go out there and they will recruit them now i also think that we do need to have we, we currently have a dedicated recruiter um i i think that if, if we are going to continue down that avenue and i'm not sure that we should then we need to have a, a better focus and an actual game plan uh, to recruit besides going to job fairs that quite frankly nobody goes to anymore Thank you. So I think that um, um, we really don't have this issue. We, um, we steal uh, people from other agencies, which is the, the best kind of stealing, because they come pre-trained for us. So, um, and we have a really good organization. I know we're talking about some negative things tonight, but we have a great agency, and I argue we're the best in the state. So we're not really in that position. We had 12 laterals uh, who applied this last time. We took five. So we're not dropping our standards. We're picking the best of the best. And really, that's word of mouth. That's our employees telling other organizations, other people, um, how great it is to work at the sheriff's office. Sure, we have some work to do. We've talked about, about that tonight. But I think that we can't forget and lose sight that we have an awesome organization. Um, our training is by far the best in the state. Um, so I just want to talk, I just wanted to put that out there. But also, you know, our PIO unit has done a fantastic job. Um, they use hip technology, Twitter and Facebook. Well, Facebook's not so hip, but uh, Twitter and, and other things that really cap capture the attention of people. We've recruited uh, people across the United States not that long ago um, because they've seen what we put out um, on our, uh, our PIO um, unit. So there's that. But also... Um, I think we could actually um, continue to be attractive. Um, our benefits package, quite frankly, the benefits package that you um, all benefit from, from CCPOA's hard work over the years, is absolutely one of the reasons why people come to us. Um, and it's, so if you're out there listening, you want to be a cop, um, come and work for uh, Clackamas County Sheriff's Office. But we can also do more to reach out to, to our, uh, our minorities um, and women. And so uh, that really, needs to be one of our focuses is how do we get the word out. Thank you. I had the opportunity to, uh, to supervise on the transit division and, uh, and, and during that time we, uh, we recruited many uh, lateral deputies and some of the things that would attract them to our unit is being on a task force. They see uh, the type of support uh, our training wise they see the equipment that we have they see that we're uh, happy in our in, in 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 our existence on those units and uh, I, th I think in the six years i was there i think many of you guys are part of people that i recruited i think there's about nine p people that came to me wanting to be at this uh, agency because of those reasons they they like the fact that uh, as deputies that we're we're beloved by our citizens that was very obvious um, so, uh, you know, as mentioned previously, our deputies are our best source of recruiting. I, I've seen that throughout the last, you know, few decades. Uh, however, we, we can't start, uh, stop short. We need to continue to uh, recruit within our military ranks. Uh, some, of our, uh, uh, some of our veterans uh, are returning to a, a civilian life. Uh, need to be part of our uh, of our agency. We need to find ways to to uh, attract them to the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office uh, within our within our college campuses at uh, job fairs uh, to attract those quality uh, applicants. We need to continue to attract uh, uh, minorities. Uh, the, the, this is a have an open uh, uh, an open heart towards that uh, that uh, recruitment. That, that diversity will really make this a positive uh, uh, and, and special department. Thank you. Question number five, we'll start the answers with Angie. 
In the current climate of anti-police rhetoric, how can the elected leader of a law enforcement organization balance the needs of the public's desire for change and protecting sworn law enforcement officers' due process rights? That's a good question. So <clears throat> I think this is where the uh, POA uh, comes in um, with all the work that uh, has been done already with the contract. And really it's, um, uh, it's really following the contract and, um, and being mindful that we do have a duty to the public, um, but there are some things that we can't release to the public and there's some things we can. So balancing that transparency, but also the rights um, of our employees is, is super important uh, in this. Um, and really following policy, following the law and information sharing when we can. Um, we do have a duty to the public, uh, but at times, the law and policy in union contracts um, all conflict. So, um, and then just being transparent about that and being honest about that and being able to say, hey, we can't share it because this is why. Uh, I think that's how, how we handle that. Thank you. First and foremost, uh, it's it's going to be a, a a collaboration with with the POA. Um, we, we absolutely they are the cornerstone for making sure that uh, the rights of, of of the members are 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 followed and addressed. Uh, we 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 need to be mindful of the transparency in this day and age. Uh, people are looking for a law enforcement agency to cover something up. Um, so you know, with that being said, we need to be honest with ourselves and make the changes that are required uh, 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 to make this a, a better environment to work in. You and I both agree that we don't like working next to someone who tarnishes our badge. Uh, the public might not realize that, that we, uh, we, uh, we, we want to see uh, someone that has a, an, an issue dealt with appropriately, justfully, and, and, and rightfully with, with, with due process. So it's important for the POA to always make sure that management follows the rules. That's one of the chief aspects of, of a labor union. It's, it, it's, it's to protect the rights of the, of the worker. Um, with that being said, being uh, brutally honest as a management team and transparent so that we don't lose the trust of the people that put us in that put us in uh, 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 in, uh, in, in in certain controls of the of the social contract they trust us to to do duties that they can't do themselves thank you could, could you read the question one more time please in the current climate of anti-police rhetoric how can the elected leaders of a law enforcement organization balance the needs of the public's desire for change and protecting sworn law enforcement officers due process rights? So we as an orga organization should change as our community changes. And we, we can't police the way that we used to. We don't, we, we don't police the way we do. We don't police now the way we did 30 years ago and there's a, there's a reason for that. I have studied at length uh, police leaders' responses uh, to critical incidents, um, specifically uh, Ferguson, Minneapolis, and Dallas. And uh, I've seen uh, good ways and bad ways. The priority is hard for the sheriff in the sense that there has to, there has to be a balance. And my priority is going to be the wellness of our employees. I've stated that uh, earlier tonight, and that will it, that that's my priority. Um, however, part of protecting that employee is working with community leaders in a critical incident and uh, feeding them uh, information. Uh, the information that will be given, of course, is going to be run through the CCPOA uh, because they are the ones who ultimately not ultimately, they are the ones who are also responsible for the well-being of the, the deputy. So it will be a collaborative effort, 
but know that uh, the scenarios that I have studied that have been successful, there has been collaboration not only with the union, but the collaboration with the community leaders. Now, when I say community leaders, I do not mean the media. I'm talking about the community leaders uh, to get them kind of a, a, a on our side. So that is a very delicate situation um, that you, you're talking about. Again, the priority is the wellness of the involved employee. And that does have to be balanced with the community need for uh, information, uh, because if that gets out of that's that's a that's a very toxic situation and it has to be managed properly thank you our final lightning round question starting with lynn over the last several years there have been multiple and well-documented disputes between the sheriff and other elected officials what is your plan to repair those relationships with these entities First of all, we need to come together and collaborate. We need to understand that every, uh, every elected official, uh, Board of County Commissioners, the, the uh, DA's office, we're, we're in this for the right reason. We're in, we're, we're in this to protect and, uh, uh, the, the uh, good citizens that vote for us. What they don't wanna see is the back and forth bickering, the, the uh, backstabbing. We need to get the politics out of these discussions and talk about the bare bones of what it takes to be effective as a government team. It's, it's incumbent on us to understand why people elect us and to put the vision in place to make things work properly. With the, uh, there's, there's other collaborations too with us and the, the municipal agencies. We need to realize their autonomy as a, a municipality, and yet the, uh, the, the duties that we have to ensure a, a, a very functional, efficient jail that gets their officers in, in, in and out uh, and back on their city streets in time. So these are case-by-case uh, -case situations that just take getting the right people at the table to make the right uh, uh, decisions. It's, I'm making a call for critical thinking and understanding. Thank you. Brian? So it is politics, it's absolutely politics. The position of sheriff is an elected official and that almost by definition is a politician. And we need uh, a politician in that role who can play the, the political game and who can play it well. And I agree with Lynn that part, part of that is collaborating, but part of being a part of politicking uh, is 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 really working with working with people and uh, the the reason that the sheriff has to be the politician is so that the deputies don't feel the effects of politics. Um, the politics will stop at the shoulder of the sheriff. And they absolutely should, but make no mistake, it, it's a it's a politics game. I've uh, been in close as PIO. I was I was in the room on several times, and there was, it was an absolute. Uh, politic way. Now, I am not the current sheriff. Uh, none, none of us are. And I have a different way of working with people. I have a different personality. I have a different leadership philosophy. I have a different uh, drive, creativity, and motivation. And I think all of those together uh, will bring new fresh, fresh blood uh, into the position of sheriff and will wipe the slate clean as much as possible with working with these polit these other uh, pl uh, leaders in, in the community. Now, I have a line in the sand, and uh, I'm not gonna be pushed around, and I'm not gonna be making backdoor deals, but make no mistake, that is the sheriff's job, is to get out there and, and, and play that game. That's all I got. Thank you. So 
so because of where I sit, um, I have a front seat view of what's happening. And I can tell you that I have already had opportunities to repair some of those relationships. Um, and it's, it's not healthy, uh, the road that we're heading down. And part of that is, is because there's years and years of, 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 of mistrust, um, distrust, lack of respect, and that, that has no place uh, in the public sphere. And um, we deserve more from our leaders. And um, for me, it's to develop relationships. Um, we don't have to uh, give up the farm on things. But we do, uh, we do need to work collaboratively together, um, not only for our employees, but for really the, the community. And the community deserves more. Um, so for us, this is a huge opportunity for us to take a huge reset, um, to restore our, our relationships with the Board of County Commissioners. Um, I already have a great relationship with the, the, the new DA, John Wentworth, that's going to be coming in. And I've worked with him for years, and I've already worked on uh, developing better relationships with, uh, with a POA. So um, I absolutely agree that um, the public uh, should not be, um, this should not be out in the public, um, these public um, spats. And so for me, uh, that's not going to happen. And it'll be uh, behind closed doors if there has to be a spat. Um, and, uh, and we deserve better than that. Our employees deserve better. Our community deserves better. Thank you. So that's the end of the lightning round questions. Now each candidate will have between five and eight minutes to make a closing statement. And we'll start with Brian. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm gonna read mine so I don't mess it up. <laughs> so uh, the decision to run for sheriff was not a last minute decision for me. In fact, it was five years in the making. The decision was not made out of anger or frustration, but out of a desire to provide much needed courageous leadership to our organization. I love working here and to see our organization in, a, in its current state breaks my heart. I know we can do better. We can do a lot better. I will bring the focus back onto our organization and the people in it. I will work collaboratively with the union and my priority will be the well-being of our employees. Making our employees a priority encompasses a wide variety of areas. I will work on getting us stable funding. I will work on getting us stable permanent funding. I will prioritize wellness. I will ensure our employees have the training they need. I will encourage the free flow of information and I will create a culture of ingenuity, idea sharing and honor. I will provide the change that we all want. There will be a new leadership team and a new culture. There will be opportunity. No matter what your role you play in our organization, you will know how you fit into our shared vision for success. I will promote the right people for the right jobs. I care about our office, I care about our county, and I care about our people. I have the dedication, creativity, and time needed for success. This is not a 40 hour a week job, and I am prepared to selflessly give what it takes to make our organization the best it can be. I will never lose sight of the fact that I work for you and I represent every one of you in everything I do and in every decision that I make. We all have an opportunity in front of us that we haven't had for decades, and that is every one of us ha will have an impact on how our agency moves forward. This is an exciting time. We are an honorable bunch, and I will make all of you proud. Thank you. Thank you. Angie. So I've uh, worked here uh, for 29 years and I love this department. Like many of you, I feel I grew up here and this is home to me. Never in a million years would I have expected uh, to be here asking you um, for your support in my run for sheriff. I wanna tell you how I became under sheriff and why I want to be your sheriff. So six years ago, I was asked to lead the Family Justice Center. I was handed basically a new business uh, with business partners who at the time uh, were not totally trusting in law enforcement. And, uh, and I was told this, this Family Justice Center cannot fail. And you know what that means. So I spent five years, I worked extremely hard developing relationships and building high performing teams. The Family Justice Center is hugely successful for our community and a much needed uh, uh, social program for our community. While I was at the Family Justice Center, I saw what was happening at Brooks and uh, the major issues that affected all of us came down to one thing and that was the lack of leadership in the command ranks. 
I, like you, recognized that we needed a new change in uh, direction and a new change in leadership. So I was optimistic when a new undersheriff was uh, promoted uh, and they had the support of the troops. Uh, when he was asked to step down, I was asked to step up. And I stepped up because I loved this department, like I said before, and I saw that it had become fractured. And, uh, and, and quite frankly, due to the lack of attention uh, that needed to be spent within to fix what is have the problems and the issues within our department. So when I became undersheriff, it was with that mindset of taking care of our own. And it wasn't about a title, and it's not about a paycheck, and it currently is not that with the title of sheriff. It's really about taking care of you so that you can take care of other people. That's my philosophy. And right away, I reached out to you when I became undersheriff, and I asked you, tell me about your unresolved issues, tell me about your safety issues, tell me about your work conditions. And I was really shocked to discover there were a lot of people things that were left undone. And I, I went to work right away. And, uh, you know, one of those is the proposals for the ballistic shields for our sergeant patrol cars. And those give you protection when you're put in harm's way. Of course that's a no-brainer. So I, f I found funding, and we, we have those in your cars now. Um, TriMet, our deputies were put unnecessarily at personal and professional risk. I negotiated to get our deputies back into our county and away from Portland politics. So pretty quickly, the, 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 the community service officers reached out to me to, to tell me they've been telling everybody ever since we moved into Brooks how cramped and inadequate their workspace was. No one will listen to them, that's unacceptable. So currently, I'm working on funding to move them up in place where we have our museum. We're gonna move stuff out and put people in. Uh, so pl that planning's underway. And then all of records, I, I, when I came in, uh, the records, uh, the entire unit, their reclassification was, they thought, at, at uh, county HR. And it had not been submitted yet. And so I, I uh, championed their reclass, and just recently uh, we actually created a new classification, which is criminal records specialist, in line with their counterparts in our other counties. Um, other things I've done, regular patrol sergeants meetings, they hadn't been done. Uh, our drone policy has been implemented, training units been formed, there's other things. I don't have enough time to talk about all of those. Uh, but these are people things, and people things are important. Um, as undersheriff for the past year, I've been working to develop meaningful relationships with the county to help us move forward. We have to absolutely have those. Um, that helped me secure the five million uh, in, in, uh, from the county to continue our operations without uh, losing a single employee. And that's because of relationships. I have endorsements for every sheriff that borders our county. I've worked with them for the last year. I have three out of the five county commissioners who have endorsed me. The other two are waiting for the POA to decide who they want, which is very respectable to me. Um, but right now, I'm the only person sitting up here with the experience and leadership who's ready to be sheriff today. We can't wait for someone to come up to speed with on-the-job training. There, there's too much at stake. So before you vote, I ask you to consider three things. One, my experience. Two, my past performance. And three, the reason why I want to be your sheriff. So I want to um, also take this opportunity to thank you, each and every one of you, because we've talked a lot of negative stuff tonight, but I really want you to know that we, we have an awesome department, and it's because of you. Um, you have hung in there and done a great job. So uh, it makes me proud to, to be here, uh, sitting in front of you tonight. So thank you. I'd be proud to work for you as your next sheriff. Thank you. So I've worked amongst you for the last uh, 20 plus years as a sergeant for a reason. As I've told you before, I asked uh, a very serious mentor sergeant why he stayed where he was and never chose to go up to upper ranks. God knows with the education and you know, whatnot, I, 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 I could have done it. But I stayed a sergeant because I could be the most effective. The most effective at making your day-to-day uh, -day activities better. Kicking obstacles out of the way to be your advocate to be your uh, advisor, and to, quite frankly, be your friend. You guys know what my leadership skills are all about. 
for the most part, you know what upsets me. You guys know that uh, some of the overly big words I use, you guys know my tenacity towards catching the bad guy. It's important to me that you, that this department finds its place again, because it has drifted. It's not that the, uh, that the, that, that the current management team uh, isn't steering the ship, the hand's not even on the tiller. And as mentioned previously, that, that comes with a loss of vision. So important that that vision is a vision that you guys agree with. So important that that vision is shared amongst us. It's developed amongst us. Now, the aspect of being your guys' advocate is a, is a, is a, is a, is a heavy task. My world's always been, and I've actually passed this, uh, this uh, information and this knowledge onto other sergeants that I've uh, trained over the years. Number one, if, if a deputy asks you a question, you find the answer. You don't make it up. You don't try to BS your way through it. So if you guys, many have noticed, I, I get that answer for you about halfway through the shift has always been what I've always uh, strived for. Second, I tell a, a, a new sergeant in training, is the tie always goes to the deputy. This is a hard enough job to carry baggage into every altercation that we get into. That deputy needs to know that they start out on a good foundation. So important to not clutter our, our, our fight for survival with worrying about how, uh, how, you know, what, how are they gonna perceive, all right? Uh, I've, I've made it a point in my career to become my own expert. I do that because I can trust in myself first and then collaborate with others, others later. I would like to encourage you guys to, uh, to be that way. Um, I've went and got a lot of education behind me and, and, and believe me, in the last two months, I've applied that to a lot of the analysis that is gonna be really necessary going into our future. With that being said, realize that with uh, my candidacy, candidacy comes experience in many facets of the job, comes untouchable leadership skill, comes, uh, I think you guys would agree, um, brutal honesty and, and, and integrity to a point where it, uh, it uh, has, a, it has a affected my path. If we can't be honest with ourselves, we can't be honest with anybody else. And I think you guys know I'm the most uh, introspective, honest person with myself. And so with that, every conversation that we've ever had has been, has been very, uh, honest and straightforward. You're born with only uh, two true possessions in your life. And this was taught to me by my father. It's your honor, your, your honesty, and your integrity. Everything else can be taken away from you in life. Your car, your spouse, your property. But you can only give away your honor and your, and, and, and your integrity. And they're the hardest things to, uh, to get back into your life. I carry that honesty, that integrity into every aspect of my life, whether it be in, in the private sector, I've, 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 I manage corporations outside of this work. I'm sure you guys are aware of that. I, uh, I, uh, uh, and into how I, I, I live my life, whether it's through my volunteerism, how, how I've, I've, I've ran my career. I would like the opportunity to take and uh, my ability to tenaciously go after the bad guy, to tenaciously advocate for your, uh, for your sheriff's office, because that's what it is, it's your sheriff's office. I'm the elected official, but really this is all about uh, your guys' safety, your happiness, and being able to give the citizens what they deserve and what they ask for. 
Thank you. Thank you. Well, that concludes the candidate forum. We thank each of the candidates for participating and hope that the information we presented here helps you make informed choices this election. The recording will be available on the CCPOA YouTube channel for a few days. And then in early April, membership vote will open and determine which candidate for CCPOA will endorse for the primary election. Please monitor the CCPOA mobile app for further communication from President Steinberg. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and healthy.